This is going to be 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And we're going to look at the subject of things a Christian needs. And in verse 1, you see where it says, Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. So, number one, a Christian needs knowledge. Now, here it looks like knowledge is a bad thing. However, when you look at knowledge throughout the Bible, it's a good thing. Knowledge is something that you want to get. In 2 Peter 3.18, it says, But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory, both now and forever. Amen. So, you need to be constantly gaining knowledge. Constantly learning something new every day. You don't want to get to a point where you just think that you've got some good knowledge so that you're going to stop. You want to just keep getting knowledge, keep learning every day. But the average Christian today rarely has any biblical knowledge. They may be a genius, but their Bible knowledge is just lacking. And Hosea 4, 6 says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. You can find lost men on the street who don't have any spiritual understanding, and yet they know more about the Bible than a lot of Christians. Atheists know more about the Bible than most Christians. The knowledge most Christians have for the Bible is flat-out embarrassing. They open their Bible at church on Sunday morning and Sunday night, and probably even Wednesday night. Throughout the week, they leave the Bible in the car or in their favorite pew at church. It's just sick. God gave us 66 books, and he wants us to read the Bible. That is how you grow. It's, it's sick the way Christians treat the Bible. 1 Peter 2, 2 says, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. The emphasis today is on church attendance. It's on tithing. It's not on reading the Bible, studying the Bible, getting closer to God through the Bible, which is the the greatest way to get close to God is reading his word. The emphasis isn't on that no more. The pastors aren't teaching the Bible, even though one of the requirements for holding an office is being apt to teach. And you can make people feel bad for their sins with hard preaching, but that guilt only lasts until Monday morning unless you can get them interested in the Bible themselves. This way they can be studying and reading throughout the week. And then they begin to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ because you can find Jesus Christ on every page. I think a congregation should be taken through verse by verse of a book or given an overview of a book and taught on different topics. If you think about that, you do that every week in a year, you'll have done 52 topics, 52 chapters. You'll have 52 books overviewed. Just in a year's time, your congregation, if they listen to that, would have more knowledge of the Bible than 99% of Christians in the world, just in one year. But Christians don't study the Bible. The pastors don't study the Bible. It's just, a, it's become, if you watch preaching on the internet, a lot of it, it's just a, people go, they got their Sunday best on, the pastor looks good, the pastor's wife looks good, the people look good, the building looks good. And it's just about, you know, the primarily now the music, no emphasis on Bible study or learning the Bible. And people have no knowledge of the Bible. And you say, well, I have to do what the Lord leads me. But he says in 2 Timothy 4, 2, to preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, repute, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Here is his words in the King James Bible. Now all you have to do is preach it and teach it. That's what the Lord's leading you to do. He's not leading you to just depart from his word and just say whatever all the time. Acts 20, 27 says, For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. You say, well, you can't just teach all the time. Well, if you do it right, then the teaching will preach at the same time. And just because you're saying Bible verses and, and looking at the Bible and using the Bible while you preach doesn't mean you're not preaching. You can preach the word. 1 Corinthians 8, 2 says, And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing, yet is he ought to know. The thing about knowledge is that after you learn a lot, you can get puffed up in your knowledge 
if you're not careful. If you think you know all about a subject, then you really don't know much. If you listen to a preacher or a teacher who's a Bible believer and you think you can't learn anything from him, then you're starting to get puffed up in your knowledge. You have all these different groups of Bible believers and they all look down on each other. Don't be so puffed up in your knowledge to the point that you think you can't learn something from someone who has spent time in the book. I can turn on James Knox and learn something. I can turn on Ruckman and learn something. I can turn on Stephen Anderson or Jack Howells or Sammy Allen and learn something. What these men do or did in their private time is not my concern. I have a Bible. You, you can learn something from, from any preacher. Use the studies and preaching of others to your advantage. Uh, 1 Corinthians 8, 3 says, But if any man love God, the same is known of him. If you're using your knowledge the right way, then people are going to know you love God. Your knowledge will be used to edify and not to make people think you're a genius. Now, verse 4 is, Concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other God but one. If you have a basic Bible knowledge, then you are going to know that an idol is nothing in the world. There is nothing to it. Revelation 9.20 shows us how they neither see, hear, or walk. If you have a basic knowledge of the Bible, then you know that. And you also know that there is none other God but one. That's very basic. 1 John 5.7 For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. He is one in three and three in one. One God. If you have a basic knowledge of the Bible, then you understand he is three in one. I don't believe anyone completely understands the Godhead, but if you have some knowledge, then you know the basics of it. For though there be that are called gods, this is verse 5, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, if you have a general knowledge of the Bible, then you know there are many things and people that are called gods, but actually aren't really gods at all but are false gods. You have the little g-gods mentioned in Psalms 82 Hall, who are notice little g-gods, but nothing compared to God because it says they die like men. You have false gods in the Old Testament who are nothing. But there is one true capital G-God. Verse 6 says, But to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. So those little G gods are nothing to us. To us there is but one God, and we are in him. He created all things. Jesus Christ created everything. Colossians 1.17 And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. He just It's not that he just was born one day. And didn't exist before that. He always existed. And if you have a basic knowledge, then you know this fact. But look at the next verse. Howbeit there is not in every man that knowledge. For some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol. And their conscience being weak is defiled. So you have that knowledge. So you should go and you shouldn't go and sit somewhere and eat meat that is sacrificed to an idol. If you're... If you have the, if that shouldn't bother you if you have the knowledge that an idol is nothing. Your conscience shouldn't bother you a bit if you know that the idol is nothing. And if your conscience doesn't bother you, Paul's basically saying it's not a sin. However, uh, if you look at it another way, not all of your brethren have that knowledge. If they saw Paul eating meat that had been offered to an idol, then they would say, well, if Paul is eating it, then I can eat it. They would go ahead and eat it, and their conscience is weak, and this would cause them to sin because they're not doing it by faith. Romans 14.23 says, And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So although the meat that's been offered to an idol, since an idol is nothing, it's not wrong for you to eat it, but it's wrong for you to eat it if you, your conscience is bothering you about it. And if you say that your conscience isn't bothering you about it and you're doing that in front of someone who, whose conscience bothers them about doing that particular thing, then you can cause them to stumble because he doesn't understand that the idol is nothing and that the meat is nothing. So his conscience would bother him. So a Christian needs knowledge to understand that he can eat anything he wants to. But since everyone doesn't have that knowledge, you don't just need knowledge 
And this brings us to the next point. You also need charity. A Christian needs charity. Because if you have charity, then you aren't going to just let the fact that you know an idol is nothing and that meat offered to an idol is nothing. You aren't going to let that fact allow you to cause your brother to stumble. Or you're not going to let the fact that you have liberty cause you to have others stumble. You don't want him to walk in and see you doing something that would cause him to stumble because you should have charity. Now look back at verse 1. Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. You can boast of your knowledge all day long, but if people don't see the charity, you will do nothing for them. And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing, yet as he ought to know. That's verse 2. So there's nothing less edifying than a man who gets up and makes everyone feel stupid and acts like he knows everything. Verse 3. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. If you love God, then your brothers and sisters in Christ and the lost world will see it. So let's read these verses again. 4 through 7. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world. The idol is, there's nothing to it, and that there is none other God but one. For there there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, but to us there is but one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Howbeit there is not in every man that knowledge, for some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. So we know that eating this meat offered to an idol, it's it's nothing, because the idol is nothing, because it doesn't really even exist. But God exists. A man which, with knowledge and charity will realize that his liberty to eat whatever he wants can cause a weak brother to stumble, and he needs to limit his liberty and to put others first. As Paul said in Romans 14, 1 through 3, Him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. So there's no need to judge the person for having a conscience against doing something. And if something is not specifically a sin, if it's not mentioned that it's a sin, and uh, you see a brother doing it, you shouldn't judge him either. Because if you don't have verses to prove it, then the fact that you don't do it becomes, it's just that you have a conviction against it. And you can't lay all your convictions on someone else unless you have a Bible to back it up. Now verse 8, But meat commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, Neither if we eat not are we the worse. So whether or not Paul ate meat offered to an idol wouldn't affect his stance with God one way or another. He's not better if he eats it, and if he eats it, he's not worse. Now verse 9, But take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. So the one with charity is keeping others in mind. He is realizing that someone is watching, and he doesn't want to be a stumbling block to those that are weak. Because Romans 14, 7 says, For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. There's always somebody watching. Now verse 10, For if any man see thee which hast knowledge, should at meet in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? So he's going to be emboldened to eat those things offered to idols. If he sees Paul sitting down there eating something like that. So if Paul was down there at Burger King or Wendy's and the meat there had been offered to an idol, then his brother would be like, he's seeing Paul, a big spiritual giant, eating meat offered to idols, so he wants to as well. He would stumble and wound his weak conscience because he wouldn't be doing it of faith. So out of love for the brethren, Paul limits his liberty because he goes on to say in verse 11, And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. So perish here isn't in the sense of John 3.16. It's, he's not going to hell for eating the meat without faith, but he's going to perish in that he's going to eat the meat without a good conscience, which would be without faith, which would be a sin. Now, verse 12 and 13, But when ye sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. So if you're causing someone to stumble because you're, you're pushing your liberty too far, 
then you sin against Christ. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. So Paul is saying he is limiting himself by not exercising all of his liberties. He doesn't want to trip up his brother. So, so a Christian should have knowledge. He should have charity. And next, you need to keep a good testimony. A good testimony, you'll see, and if you look at verses 8 through 13, again, but it says, But meat comm commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. For if any man see thee which hath knowledge sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. But when ye sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. Wherefore, if my meat, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. So if Paul lets a weak brother see him eating things offered to idols, then he can ruin his testimony with his brethren. You don't want to make your brother to offend and one of those things is having a christmas tree in jeremiah 10 you have people cutting down trees and decorating them and worshiping them for that reason many christians won't have a christmas tree but a tree is nothing an idol is nothing it can't do good and it can't do bad it's just a tree you can have a tree in your house and it won't affect you one way or another but another christian can't have it in good conscience i could care less about a tree but if you have a brother that is against a Christmas tree and against Christmas entirely, just don't invite him over for Christmas dinner. I mean, there's nothing sinful about having that tree. But a lot of Christians are against men wearing shorts. So if you're going to go shoot hoops with your brother in Christ who doesn't like shorts, then wear some sweats. Now, you have to admit, a short shorts that show the thigh is what shows your nakedness, but shorts that go to the knee doesn't show your nakedness. So isn't it kind of funny that Allen Iverson was more modest than Larry Bird in that sense? But I mean, people have different convictions and you can wound someone's weak conscience. You're not going to be able to please everyone's convictions all the time, but you can try to. Don't just have the attitude of just being content with being offensive to your brothers and sisters in Christ. And there's so many examples of this. Different scenarios where someone's got a conviction against something that's not really in the Bible and another Christian doesn't have that. What you should do is when you're around that person that's that has a conviction against something, don't do that particular thing around that person. First Thessalonians 5.22 says, Abstain from all appearance of evil. Try your best to live right. Try your best to live holy. A lot of people say, I don't care what anyone thinks. And that's true to a certain extent that you shouldn't care but then it is also true that you should care whether or not your brother thinks you're living right. You don't want your testimony to be ruined with another brother in Christ. But this has been 1 Corinthians chapter 8.